everyone, and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast, Time Hop Edition. This is Christopher here with Tom. Tom, how are you tonight? I am hopping right along. Excellent. Very good. We're going to talk about a new screener that we got a hold of called Blood Covered Chocolate from 2022. A recovering drug addict, Massimo, is getting his life back on track with the help of his girlfriend, Tien. Together, they celebrate his birthday and his anniversary of staying clean. After an uncomfortable dinner with his mom and her boyfriend, Massimo is attacked and bitten by an ancient shape-shifting monster from Vietnamese mythology. Now undead and with a craving for blood, he must fight to protect the people he loves and to keep control of his life as it spirals out of control. This was written by writer-director Monte, Monty Light. Uh, not a, a filmmaker I was familiar with. Monty Light has a very uh, limited uh, filmography at this point. He's only got four credits on IMDb. So Blood Covered Chocolate was... I mean, I was kind of taken by the trailer when the, they... Watch the trailer. It, there's an art to making a trailer, mm-hmm. and there are people that are very gifted. I was pretty pulled in. I was like, okay, this looks like this could be, this could be trippy and kind of interesting. A lot of the trailer was black and white with splashes of color. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I was looking forward to. Uh, the film does do that, but I found that it kind of did it sporadically. Yeah, when, like. It is predominantly black and white. Um, Right. And it's not that it doesn't work for it, although I don't know what that was supposed to evoke. But yeah, when they did involve color, it was unclear why. I mean, I got Mm -hmm. it when they did... I I get the trippier stuff where they were doing the kaleidoscopic um, kind of displays on the screen. But then they did some parts where the actual action was in color, and it was unclear why. There was one that was uh, very... He's on a uh, like a a Skype call or or a Zoom call with his girlfriend. It would shift where, you know, he's in black and white, but her screen, his screen and seeing her is in color. But then there's moments when he's in color Mm -hmm. for... I, I, I don't know if we're supposed to be looking through her screen at that moment, but it's full screen, so it just looks like we're in his room, so suddenly he's in color. Yeah, it's just... The whole film, I feel like, okay, I think I get what you're trying to do, but I don't think you accomplished it. Right. It, it wanted to be an art film, but didn't know how to apply its artistic elements to the message it was trying to convey, which in and of itself is kind of a shame because ultimately, I think I like this thing. There's a lot that I liked. It's one of these films where I can't decide if I... No, I think I can decide. I don't know if I would say I liked the film overall. Right. But there's a lot of elements in this film that I liked. And and maybe that's what I'm struggling with because... Ultimately, and, and, and I'm not trying to get in anything away, but where this film goes compared to the uh, the monster elements of it, the horror elements of it, um, it was an interesting take on the theme that it's trying to do. Um, without giving anything away, mental health plays into this. So having a story that evolves around some of the basic elements that we conceive of as vampirism and monsters and the horror that comes into that and how that might relate in a in a mental health situation was fascinating when you got to the end. I, that's what I latched on to. I, I latched on to... What we saw, and we've been down this road before with other screeners that we've seen where uh, I'm thinking back to the Edgar Allan Poe-themed one that we saw recently, Mm -hmm. um, where it's not clear that what we watched is actually what happened. And this had a lot of that element, but I thought it did it more effectively than that film did. Oh, you think this one did it more effectively? I actually kind of do, yeah. Mm, uh, interesting. I, I liked where it landed, ultimately, in the end. But yeah, all those artistic 
expression moments that he had throughout. I would have done those way differently when to give them more punch. If this was what you're trying to do, those color shift moments, imagine if those moments were lined up when with when reality is real and the moments that he's having that are not are in in black and white or vice mm. versa even. Right. Which would allow the uh, the viewer to kind of go back and piece it together in their head and they're like, oh, okay. You know, you could review it in your mind and, and, and figure out what was real and what, what wasn't. Yep. For me, the, um, the end, I, I too, I, I like the idea of this being a sort of mental health more than mythological, mm-hmm. you know, uh, shape-shifting monsters and stuff like that. But it comes so fast and so late in this film mm-hmm. It almost it, it really kind of feels like a cop out. <laughs> I want to say you know I'm saying I I liked that angle, but I was disappointed that that's the direction this film took. We think the director slash writer Monty here had a great idea and maybe just didn't pull it all together quite right. Monty, if you want to talk to us, come, come talk to us because I would love to know more. Uh, the I like the element where they're in bed early at the beginning of the movie, right at the start. Interestingly enough, we jump literally right into bed at the beginning of the film. And after their lovemaking and all that, and they're talking in, in bed, um, she mentions this mythical creature as, as something her grandmother or somebody was telling her about in order to keep her on a path of virginity. Because they introduced that then, I get that in what's going on in Massimino's head, Massimo's head, he latched onto that and then built a fantasy world around it that then landed elsewhere by the time we get to the end of the film. But you were not given the transitions necessary to kind of understand that maybe that's what had happened. And it actually makes me think now those kaleidoscopic moments that I had mentioned where we just get flashes of light and color and and such on the screen. I'm wondering if those are supposed to portray, uh, I don't know, his brain breaking down at those moments and now he's shifted but because the way they happen and the way that it's unclear, because the bulk of the movie lives in this transition state, we're not getting that notion that maybe he's sliding in and out of reality and his perception of it. So could have been executed better, but I think he was on to something. Yeah, I really feel like this was a case of this is like um, imagine someone trying to describe to you some really great novel, mm-hmm. but they're describing it really poorly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, it's all about the, there's a great idea, but the execution isn't there. Yo, have you never read Moby Dick? Yeah. It's about this guy who really hates this whale. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're not quite selling me yet, but <laughs> And not quite hitting the mark either. It's not an accurate description <laughs> exactly. of what you're about to read. And exactly, I think he had an idea here and he didn't accurately pull it off in a way that it made sense. It's one of those painful ones where you really find yourself wanting to like it because there's so much going on that you, you like the look of, you like the idea of. Um, you even like some of the lines and, and some of the things that are going on. And then at the end, you're just still going, uh. <laughs> it's frustrating. It, it, it is frustrating, too, because uh, and my, Michael Klug plays the Massimo character. Um, and I don't know if it's either on his part or direction, but if. If we're on to what this was really supposed to be about, if this was what we were supposed to experience, I I don't know that he was pulling that off either because there were a lot of times where he's kind of flat through it all. And 
if he's really wrestling with these things, it's unclear where he's at in that process. It, 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 since this does have a mental health slant, um, like he's not, he's doing things that seem manic, but they fall off as really, really lackluster. They're not, they're not, they're not as frenzied as they should be if he indeed is having a meltdown moment. Like we, mm-hmm. we see moments where this is a guy that's supposed to be in, in, uh, rehabilitation he he's earning his way back into sobriety and all of that but then when he has breakdowns through the movie into that they just don't they don't have any punch to it it it, it's not clear what the character is trying to do in the moment i mean this is an independent film and i i hate using this to, to sound derogatory or whatever but all the actors in the film it feels like an independent film. It does. And I, uh, yeah, I, I hate saying that as if, as if that's a mark against it. There's different levels that you sometimes find in independent films. And sometimes you, you're surprised. Like, I can't believe this is an independent film because this actor is incredible. This one, I just, yeah, this has that independent film all over it. And it's not in itself a bad thing. It's just, you wish there was that one shining moment or one shining star uh, in the film to maybe help it rise above. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess going down that road, if you liken it to theater, you have Broadway, where that's the top. You have off Broadway, which is people are reproducing a Broadway thing with other actors, but it's still pretty professional. And then you have community theater. <laughs> and, and this feels more like community theater as opposed to an off-Broadway production. Like, yeah. when I think independent, I, 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 want, I want commitment from everybody involved. And this feels more like, uh, I'm doing this in my spare time. Uh, Christine Nguyen, who played Tien, I think she has the most moments where I feel like, oh, you know, she's closer to that off Broadway. Yes. And I think that only makes everyone else kind of stand out more that they're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the moments that you get with her character, especially with the Massimo character, you're kind of like, why are you putting in the level of effort <laughs> that you are <laughs> with, with, with this person? Because uh, Tien is essentially a hero in this film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in every sense of that word. You're just like, I'm glad you're that person, but is this the person to put in that level of commitment to? Mm-hmm. And it's because I don't think that he pulled off the character he was supposed to be quite as well as she did. It's definitely a film that I think it's worth checking out. Yes. Uh not sure who to recommend it for. If you're a horror fan, maybe you're going to f- come away uh, wanting. Um, maybe if you're, just, if you're just a fan of independent film and maybe a fan of uh, films that try to take that artistic route, then uh, the, yeah, maybe this is the one for you. I think uh, uh, on, on a more personal level, if you're somebody looking for... Um I'm I'm struggling with calling it positive, but still kind of positive representation uh, of mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, this is actually not bad. It, 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 if you actually just lay it out for what it is and suggest that what we go through is a struggle of a disturbed mind that is just not taking advantage of what's available to him... Um, and he has someone who loves him enough to be that person for him, it's a positive outlook. But you have to make it through the slog to get there. <laughs> right. Well, and a little bit of that slog is helped by the, the one actress, uh, Megan Kingsley, plays Sophia, mm-hmm. the uh, the younger of the shape-shifting agent, uh, uh, creature appearances or whatever. She has a real unconventional look about her. Mm-hmm. 
And it's a real unconventional beauty, I think. I, I was a little mesmerized just by her appearance throughout the film. So that kind of helped get through the, some of the slog. <laughs> it, it did. No, uh, when she was on screen, I was a present <laughs> in the moment. Yeah. And not for any of the obvious reasons. I mean, she pulled off that character that she had to play fairly well. Like, yeah. She had a really nice demonic quality to her while just being the pretty girl on screen at the time. Mm -hmm. it, it was really good. I liked it. I enjoyed her performance rather quite a bit. Yeah. All right. Well, this film comes out April 7th. And uh, it, it'll, so look for it on your favorite streaming services. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to find it. Um, and as Tom mentioned just before we started recording, if nothing else, it has a really great poster. <laughs> <laughs> this it might does. be a good this might be a good Blu-ray to buy just to have the cover art. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'd be really curious if they actually do a uh, a physical media release on this if there's I'm hoping they'll do like a director's commentary cuz I think that would be really interesting for this film to try to actually kind of get some of his what he was attempting get inside his head for the film yeah no there, there's a deeper thought to this and whether or not he pulled it off i would love to get in more on where he was going with it all right yeah so everyone uh, go and check out blood covered chocolate uh, as i said april tw uh, 7th uh, 2023 and uh yeah and come back and let us know what you think mm -hmm. if you uh, if you give it a watch i'd really curious to see what uh, you all pull out from it absolutely uh, we'll be back in a week with a full episode. Until then, thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you all later. Bye. See ya.